At this point in the 21st century, it's possible to live completely within the sharing economy. You don't need to own anything. You can find an apartment or a PG on Stanza Living or Zolo, somewhere close to where you work. You can rent furniture and appliances from Ferlenco or Rento Mojo. You can get your subscription water from Drink Prime. And then if your office is close enough, you can hop on a Yulu and get there without walking. Or if you need to travel further, there's even e-bike subscriptions now too. You can rent an electric two-wheeler long-term with EVs or Zip Electric. And of course, you've also got ride hailing companies like Ola and Uber. And while you're sitting in your cab, you're not gonna watch a DVD or listen to a CD or a song that you bought on iTunes. You're gonna pull out your phone and watch Netflix or listen to Geo Southern or Spotify. And this is basically normal for a lot of us, right? This is just how we live our lives. Why buy something that's probably gonna end up depreciating in value over time when you can just rent it or subscribe to it? You don't wanna be tied down to a car loan or a mortgage, or boxes and boxes of stuff. You wanna be unburdened. You wanna be mobile and liquid. And this is a powerful idea. It's attractive, it's exciting, which is why the sharing economy is a $2 billion market right now. And it's not just something that individual consumers are gravitating towards. Companies are also beginning to adopt this asset light model. This is why SaaS has become so huge in recent years, software as a service. Companies don't wanna build software in-house. They wanna to subscribe to it. And it's the same thing with offices. Companies like WeWork and IndieCube are offering plug and play enterprise office solutions. And if you wanna take care of your employees' commutes, there's plenty of fleet management companies like Everest Fleet. But now we have an interesting question to answer. What if you wanna provide these services? What if you're a startup founder and you wanna build a company to meet the needs of India's rapidly growing sharing economy? I gave the example of Yulu earlier, but how do you create a fleet of thousands upon thousands of electric scooters? Another example would be Stan Plus, a 15 minute emergency response service with a fleet of 900 ambulances. Or if we're talking furniture, then how do you create an inventory of thousands of tables, chairs, sofas, and beds like Ferlenco? Well, the conventional path, of course, is to raise funds from investors. You go and meet with a few dozen or maybe 100 VCs and try to convince them to let you give them stake in your company in exchange for capital. But nobody wants to give up equity in their startup. And so the next idea that comes to mind is borrowing from the bank. And a lot of startups do this. And maybe you have to put up some collateral, your house, for example. But that's one way to avoid giving up ownership in your company. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a third option. And no, it's not borrowing money from family and friends. It's called lease investing. And I know that that term probably doesn't mean anything to you, but don't worry, it'll make sense soon. And to illustrate how this actually works and why it's needed, I'm gonna tell you guys a short story because this way of financing a vehicle fleet or an inventory hasn't always been a thing. The year is 2009, and a young MBA graduate by the name of Nikhil Agarwal has just started his career at HSBC Bank. From there, Nikhil will end up at Morgan Stanley, where he's able to work with startup founders and helps them to take their companies public. And this experience inspires him. He decides that he wants to jump into the world of entrepreneurship himself, leaving the investment banking space behind to start a disruptive company in transportation. This startup was called Cello, and it would go on to become India's number one bus transport technology company. Building Cello was an exciting time in Nikhil's life. He learned a lot about mobility on the ground, about the ins and outs of transportation in India for everyday people. It was a micro view, a masterclass in getting people from point A to point B. But after spending about three years getting Cello up and running, Nikhil realized that he also wanted to gain insight into the macro view. He wanted to understand mobility from a global perspective. So he handed the reins over to his co-founders at Cello and joined the World Bank as a consultant. And he's still there to this day, but, and this is where things start to get interesting, during his first few months at the World Bank, one of the biggest problems that he identified in the global mobility space was scalability. Service startups like Cello need tons of capital in order to build fleets or inventory. Without this capital, they just can't get off the ground quickly enough to be competitive. And as somebody with experience on both sides of the investment space, Nikhil knew that India was full of investors looking for exciting new places to grow their wealth. And this is where the light bulb moment happens. Nikhil thought, why not just combine these two problems and create one solution? connect retail investors with startups that are trying to finance a fleet or inventory. No need for a bank loan, no need to trade equity for venture capital. Instead, Nikhil realized that he could offer startups a sort of crowdfunded investment solution. 
In the summer of 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, Nikhil launched this solution. This inventory financing lease investing platform, along with his two co-founders Ashish Jindal and Vivek Kulati. It's called GRIP, and it's India's largest alternative investment platform. But how does it actually work? And more importantly, how can you, as a startup founder or as a retail investor, participate? Well, let's take a look at an example. So earlier I mentioned Zip Electric, and they're one of India's leading EV as a service platforms. They have a fleet of over 2,000 scooters across 10 Indian cities, but they didn't buy all of these scooters themselves. If they had, it would have cost them close to 10 crore rupees for the entire fleet. So this is where Grip comes in. They enabled Zip Electric to secure funding so that they could build this fleet. First, Zip Electric paid Grip 10% of the amount that they needed to build this fleet. So let's say one crore rupees. This was a security deposit, kind of like how a bank would take collateral. And then Grip went out and raised money from investors on Zip Electric's behalf. Once they'd gotten commitments from enough investors for the amount that Zip Electric needed to build its fleet, Grip created a special purpose vehicle, an LLP that pays for and owns the fleet. That's why I said earlier that that Zip Electric didn't actually buy their fleet of electric scooters, and they don't own it either. Their investors, the ones who paid for the fleet and the ones who make up this LLP, are the ones who own it. And for this ownership, they get fixed monthly returns up until the day that Zip Electric finishes paying for the fleet themselves. And by the time that happens, their investors through Grip will have made a pre-tax IRR, that's internal rate of return, of up to 22%. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that this sounds like a really good deal for the investors, but what about Zip Electric? Well, the great thing here is that Zip Electric starts making money right away. While their investors are enjoying fixed monthly returns, Zip is enjoying the revenue from their EV as a service platform, which more than covers the cost of the financing that they've raised. In a nutshell, this is a win-win for everybody. Zip gets their fleet for a fraction of the price up front, and all they have to do is pay a small monthly EMI, and investors get their money back with a decent return. And unlike with angel or VC investments, Grip investors don't need to wait for months or years to see this return. They get paid every month. In 2021, after the success of Zip Electric's first funding round with Grip, they signed a deal to finance an additional 750 electric scooters. Now, I use this example because it's a success story for Zip Electric, for Grip, and all of the investors who participated. That being said though, this definitely isn't a one-size-fits-all. Nikhil Agarwal himself, for example, says that Grip shouldn't be someone's first investment platform. It's mainly intended for people who already have some experience with investing. But if you know your way around FDs, stocks, or mutual funds, and you want to diversify your investments once you've already built a strong portfolio, then Grip might actually be a good fit. As you can see from Grip's website, they openly publicize an average IRR of 21%. This means that Grip isn't just taking into account the interest that you get on your investment, but also the fact that you're seeing part of your return every single month. And at the very least, this month monthly return protects you from the erosion of inflation, which is about 6% every year here in India. But if you're smart, you can actually take that money and reinvest it somewhere else too, or even with grip for that matter, so that your ROI is making you even more money. Now, the big question is, what happens if something goes wrong over at the company that you've invested in via Grip? If a startup like, for example, Zip Electric can't afford to pay you and the rest of the LLP back? Well, that's where the 10% security deposit that I mentioned earlier comes in. And Grip is going to be monitoring the company closely. They'll be keeping an eye on its finances so that they'll be able to try and stop things from going wrong. But even if something does go wrong, the LLP that you, the investor, are a part of still own the assets. And that's independent of Grip or the company that you've invested in through Grip. So Grip can, with your permission, easily reassign those assets to another leasing partner or simply sell them on your behalf and get you your money back. But realistically, that scenario isn't likely to happen because since March of 2022, Grip has facilitated investments worth 200 crore rupees through their platform. And so far, there haven't been any defaults. Ultimately, these kinds of investment opportunities, both within India and around the world, have historically only been options for HNIs, that's high net individuals. Grip is one of the few platforms that enables regular everyday people, retail investors, to invest in these kinds of companies, many of them startups with as 
little as 10,000 rupees. And they're just getting started too. Griff is on a mission to provide retail investors with investment options that have never been available to anybody outside of the wealthiest 10% of Indians. In fact, they're planning on piloting several new investment products this year in 2022. And just like the democratization of leasing as an opportunity for retail investors, several of their new products are gonna be industry first. They're planning to grow 5x to 1,000 crore rupees in total transaction value by the end of 2022. And it's gonna be really exciting to see what they come up with in the next couple of months. But anyways, guys, that's enough from my side. I really hope that you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.